And this is a perfect week to have you because, boy, there was a lot of action in the market. What did you make of it? Well, it was wild indeed for an August. And even though the s and is back to where we were last Friday, let's just for a moment talk a little bit about what the causes were for the volatility around the world. Uh, as said, a lot of conversation around the Bank of Japan hiking, poor timing around the hiking, and uh, the unwind of the yen carry trade, this legendary yen carry trade. It's real, always difficult to know just how big it is. But what happened last week was that not only did the BOJ hike, uh, the Fed put on the table uh, the, the possibility of a cut in September. But then don't forget we had that jobs report on Friday. And the jobs report had a, a jump, a further climb in the unemployment rate to 4.3%. And it triggered what a lot of people are calling the, the SOM rule, SOM indication of a recession in progress. And the job creation numbers were still good, 114,000 on the payroll survey. Uh, but a lot of panic broke out, particularly in the bond market, that maybe the Fed's way behind and maybe emergency cuts are necessary. So just as the BOJ, when I think they could have done this earlier in the year, decided to do a hike last week. You have the Fed and then data suggesting the Fed may be cutting a lot. It was kind of crossing the streams. It's really dangerous to cross the streams to major central banks moving in different directions. And that sparked um, yen appreciation. People trying to probably pay back some of their yen loans. That's part of what created all the volatility and made markets, particularly Japan, fall out of bed on Sunday night. Uh, yen appreciated, Japanese stocks down 20%, more than 20% at one point, led by the big banks. Uh, it hurt uh, other global equity markets on Monday, but we've recovered. And there's more going on, though, than Japan during the week and last week. But David, how much do you think was the markets and how much was the economy? I mean, you referred to recession possibility and some of the banks started saying, well, we're taking up our probability of recession, something that last year we thought was a real probability, now not so much. Where are you on the probability of recession? I think we're still a safe distance from recession. Uh, we do, at DWS, we expect the economy to slow further. Um, but I don't think we're slipping into a recession, not right now. Um, what happened this week, late last week, I think is more about investors overreacting, sometimes putting words into policymakers' mouths about what they may be doing, uh, or maybe just overreacting to if you step in one direction, how much further you're going to go, whether it be hikes or cuts. Um, but there was this background of other concerns. We've had geopolitical risks. We've had investors take additional concern with what remains a weak economy in China and a weak manufacturing economy in Europe and still weak in the United States outside of data centers and chips. And then in earnings season. Well, the earnings season is basically done. 90% of companies have reported. And while the results have came, come in OK, we're still hearing from the non-tech companies that business is sluggish, manufacturing, consumer businesses. They're cautious about the outlook as well. And I would just say, even though we've got 10% year-on-year growth out of S&P earnings, about $60 a share in the second quarter, uh, it's all still coming from big cap tech. It doesn't help it's in August, and so the markets are not as uh, liquid as we normally right. expect, right? But what are you expecting for the rest of the year, given where we are on earnings right now, all the factors? Where do you think the S&P 500 is headed for the rest of the year? I think markets going to stay volatile. Markets can be volatile, particularly any day, any week. By the way, options and futures markets can be even more volatile. I think the volatility is with us. We've been shaken by some of the events that, that broke out. And I think that those risks and those concerns, particularly the election and the uncertainty for what that means for taxes and tariffs. And I think investors want to see some election outcome that keeps taxes low and prevents tariffs from going higher. Um, but you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around the elections. And I think markets will stay volatile, uh, at least until then. And we have a 5,300 target for the S&P at the end of this year. There is some upside if tax rates stay low and tariffs don't go up. But I, I, I think the S&P flirts with 5,000 uh, a couple more times before the election. And I don't think there's much upside uh, if the election puts forth some challenges. So here at the end, pick some stocks for us. Not individual stocks, but sure. categories. What sure. do you like right now, given this environment? Yeah, there are still things. Well, one of the things, uh, there's been a lot of storms in New York City this <laughs> August week and up and down the East Coast. Right. And there's a lot of electricity in the air, uh, particularly for utility companies. Yeah. And these, these companies have done extremely well year to date. Uh, the utility sector is up 17 percent, beating the S&P 15 percent up year to date, uh, while paying a three and a half percent dividend versus the S&P's one and a half. So utilities are doing really well. 
And if we get lower interest rates short term, perhaps, perhaps lower long term yields, uh, then utilities should even do better. So utilities, uh, some of the uh, cell phone tower companies, uh, infrastructure stocks uh, have been doing well lately, and I think they'll continue to do well. Yeah, and there's, certainly there's a demand for the electricity coming out of the data centers, right, for AI, without a doubt. Voracious demand. 